Good morning, coaches. Um, this is Coach Wildman, and uh, today we have our co-host is Coach Brennan um, from Ace Volleyball Club in uh, Calgary, Alberta. And today our honorary guest is Coach Karai. I it, it is such an honor to have you a part of this. Um, I I've been having butterflies in my stomach talking to you uh, since you agreed to do this and I know there's a lot of other people here uh, that are checking in and tuning in that are um, pretty stoked to have you here so uh, thank you for joining us. And the first one is kind of with the challenges that we were facing. Uh, I know with us as coaches out there in Canada and all over we've had to tell our athletes you know um, we were postponed, your season's cancelled, I can't imagine what the conversation, and I just want to pick your brain, and the morale was like after you had to tell your athletes that the 2020 Olympics were postponed. What was the morale like, and how did you keep your team connected, motivated to train? Well, um, I think the morale was a whole lot better than if the news was the Olympics were cancelled. Postponement is a totally different a better piece of news than cancellation. So, um, and I think there's still a small chance of cancellation. Um, our hope, our great hope, and not just us, but sports fans all over the world, fans of the Olympics and the Olympic movement all over the world are sure hoping and uh, staying very optimistic that the Olympics will happen this year. So. It was certainly a disruption in the schedule, a change in the schedule, but still the schedule exists. And so um, that was the first thing. In, in one sense, um, volleyball players who play on their respective national teams, whether it's the somebody like Alexa Gray for the Canadian national team or for the Americans on our women's national team or men on all those national teams too. They play essentially two seasons every year. They play volleyball almost nonstop. Like nobody in the WNBA or NBA would think, yeah, I want to do that. I want to play <laughs> volleyball or my beloved sport basketball if they're in those other leagues I mentioned. And I want to do it 11 and a half months out of the year. That is a really tough task, but that's essentially what they're being asked. So in one sense, I think national team athletes, the world over, not just any one country's athletes, got a break. They got to, and, and in fact, were forced to take a break, forced to, to spend more time, especially with cl close family, where they might have been in lockdown situations. And so uh, in one sense, it was a real recharging time. So I think there's a, a big positive out of that uh, to reconnect with people that are, it's so hard to stay connected to when uh, your family might live in Canada or the USA, but you might be playing volleyball in China or Italy or Turkey or Brazil. So that was, um, I think, actually has turned out to be a very nice positive. Um, of course, there were some negatives, and you know, nobody really got to do any of the kind of volleyball that we would have liked to have done national team-wise, uh, both for women's teams and men's teams in all of 2020. But um, then on individual level, I think some players, and this applies to a lot of different countries, especially looking toward the Olympics, I think people who were maybe having a great, uh, they were playing volleyball at a really nice high level in January, February, and March, they're thinking, oh, dang, I wanted to carry that momentum right on into would love to try to carry that into the national team season, the summer season, and maybe to the Olympics. And then there are others who might have had injuries or had a down year who are thinking, whoo, nice, get, get an extra 12 months. From a team standpoint, we, it's a choice that we have made. I don't know what other teams have done, but our choice is this is what it is, so we are thankful. We have 12 more months to, to sharpen our swords and to prepare for the Olympics, and that's ultimately how we as a team are approaching. Well, that's, 
a very good positive way to look at that as a you know longer time to prepare and train and even heal up maybe some injuries as well hey um i was going to ask um what would you tell a young inspiring women's coach that's just starting out um you've had success as a coach as a player um what would you tell them to focus on in their training practice practice or curriculum at any level like what are some key things that you can think of well um one of the first things that's really important for any coach is just the idea of um, trying to establish a framework from which to operate, some guiding principles. And hopefully, um, I guess, uh, informed very much based on what we know, what, what people have studied, for example, there's been a lot of study over the decades about motor learning and skill acquisition. And that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to help people acquire more and better volleyball skills and more and better teammateship skills. And so there are some principles. For example, one is that if we want to acquire those skills, then we have to be doing, we only get so many hours, especially if I'm a club coach or a high school coach, coaching younger athletes, we only get so many hours a week. Mm -hmm. Let's call it three or four if we're lucky under normal conditions, not today's or conditions of the last nine months, but under other circumstances. Maybe a club team gets to practice four hours, maybe a high school team gets a little more than that, but it's a limited amount. So how do we get the most out of every hour, every minute, every activity, every opportunity to respond, every touch? We have to make sure that things we do are as similar as possible to what will happen when we have a uniform on. So that would be a kind of a guiding principle is um, trying to make game-like things happen as much as possible when we train because that's what we're preparing our teams for. So it's really, I think, helpful to have some guiding principles. Uh, another would be just in learning in general. How do we foster more learning? How do we reach our learners uh, and get to know our learners and help accelerate their learning process? So I, think, I think it's really helpful to have some guiding principles that then will help us make the thousands of decisions that we have to make during the course of a given season. What was it? Uh, one of the legends of coaching in our country who uh, passed away not so long ago, and we miss him, Carl McGowan. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, he might have said something like, uh, coaching is not rocket science. It might be more complicated. But so, so we have to have guiding principles that will help us with uh, lots of those decisions. One of the guiding principles that the great coaches I got to play for when I was on the USA team early in my career, and we had a nice, a really strong rivalry against the great Canadian team of that time in the early 80s, but our coaches, Doug Beal and Bill Neville and Tony Crabb, um, one of their principles was we want to expose the players who are best at any particular skill to, execute, to put them in a position where they can uh, execute that skill the most. So a fundamental one is who sets the best on our team. We'll make him, Dusty Dvorak in that case, we'll make him our full-time setter. Who are the best at service reception? Well, we'll form a new system because our two best, Aldous Berzins and Karch, uh, most teams have passed with three receivers in the past, but we're going to try and follow that principle and just expose the two very best at that skill. And so we had some division of responsibilities, division of labor in that sense, and allowed those uh, specialists to execute at a higher level and do it more often. Those would be examples of a couple of principles by which they operated, which was greatly to our team's benefit. And, but that applies to every level of coaching, from coaching beginners, coaching on up to Olympic athletes, is have some 
sound principles, things that aren't vi violating all we know about motor learning and skill acquisition and things like that, and all we know about how to execute uh, as a volleyball team better. That would be my, my first suggestion, is get getting some real clarity there uh, for, for your teams. And, and I would say, also, I'm not in any way um, underplaying the role of young coaches and young athletes uh, and you can make very strong arguments that the very best coaches we have are the ones we should be having working with 12, 13, 14 year olds mm -hmm. when the most learning is taking place, when we can establish the strongest foundation for them to have um, a long and enjoyable and passionate volleyball career. Yeah, I agree. You've been playing since you were six I hear right so that yeah so, uh, so I'm not saying that to put the pressure on <laughs> but uh, to put the pressure on young coaches to be great for their young athletes but um, and I know they are doing it but just know we I, I coach I don't coach at that level now I got my coaching start at that level mm -hmm. I know how important it is we honor that responsibility and um, we are cheering everybody on because it's a really important job to be teaching beginning volleyball players and giving them a great experience and helping them learn so that they'll want to come back. We all want volleyball to keep growing as a sport, so we want them to have good early experiences that can really ignite their passion for the game and win lifelong fans when it goes well. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. I believe he has a question. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, for everyone who's joining us, we have Coach Karai from the women's uh, women's head coach at Team USA uh, joining us. Um, Lee Carter is the head coach of the University of Brandon women's team. Uh, he says Karch uh, was part of a committee that was looking at FIVB rule changes. Uh, they made some recommendations about substitutions. Uh, would he tell us if he could change FIVB sub roles? Would he, and and how? Thanks, Lee. Uh, really good question. Um, there is some talk. Uh, certainly, the rules commission at the FIVB uh, is always looking at proposals. We all need to be looking at the best ways that we can improve this already great game, but we don't want to be happy just with where it is. We want to look for ways to, to make it better. And, but, but we also have to be careful because we can't just be instituting radical changes each and every year because mm -hmm. then nobody will even know it's really hard to follow those from the top down in 206 competing countries around the world and so it's important not to change radically and frequently because the game gets lost and fans won't even know what the rules are anymore but regarding substitutions i am in favor of seeing some things uh, if it were in my hands i think what i would do is add two substitutions uh, or at least, uh, sorry, I wouldn't just change the rule. I think any rule change needs some real investigation before we do it. And so I would advocate for testing a rule where we have six substitutions that um, are traditional. The, a player who is on the court can go out and come in. That uses two. A player who's off the court can come in and go out. That would uh, use that would be the uh, other half of that same pair of substitutions so traditionally we get six of those uh, I would advocate adding two more to be used any way a coach would want so that is maybe uh, the same player who came in the game once and came out could come in again for a different position mm -hmm. or for the same position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's some talk that the FIVB is going to experiment with something similar uh, this year, assuming that some of the youth championships or age group championships happen this year. We're keeping our fingers crossed that lots of competition 
more and more competition can happen as um, as time goes on here, especially with vaccination uh, vaccination programs and things like that. Um, but the talk at the FIBB is the possibility would that it would be that um, you wouldn't add to substitutions as I was uh, just advocating for, but that those six substitutions could be used in a slightly different way. And uh, if a player were on the court, she or he or she or he would still just have two come off and come on. And that would be it for that person. But uh, from a bench standpoint, the uh, you, again using those six substitutions, the proposal is, and it might be used is, or tested this year, is that a player in the bench area could come in for one person, then out, in for another person, then out, and then finally in for a third person and out. So one scenario uh, I could see that impacting the game immediately is at some point, maybe a coach brings in a huge blocker for three straight attempts uh, for three different players along the net uh, to bolster the blocking at some point in a game to 25 points. I still am not a big fan of the word set to both describe this and to describe what we do when somebody gets to 25 ahead by two. I'm a traditionalist there and I think we play best three out of five games, not sets. I, I hate the uh, the confusion in terminology because sets can mean multiple things. Mm -hmm. But uh, where another place where I could see that proposal coming into play is if we have a serving specialist. Late in the game, you could bring the serving specialist in for three straight turns at the service line for three different players. <laughs> so I could see some... Uh, some real value for a team in a, 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 and you could allow a server then to get more rhythm. It's really difficult to just come in, let's say, hit a jump spin serve. You've been waiting until the game gets to 22, 21. You're on the, you're in the bench area. It's hard to stay warm and ready for that. But if you can come in for one turn, then another turn, then another turn, that would uh, create some really interesting things. So, um, and I think it would also, it could also add some real fan interest to follow these people who bring a very special skill, but a great skill to help their team uh, swing the advantage uh, toward that team in a close game. So, Coach Cry, I've uh, been lucky to hear you speak multiple times. Uh, I was in Pittsburgh in the NCAA Final Four, and then I, I heard your segment on the AVCA convention that was online this year. Um, you know, you're, you're coaching at the highest levels. You've played at the highest levels. You've won Olympic medals as a player, as a coach. Um, but I think a lot of people probably don't know you started coaching when you coached your kid. So can you kind of go into how you got into coaching and what sort of uh, things surprised you when you transitioned from a player to a coach? Absolutely. Uh, and before a great question, before I answer that, I would uh, think back to the rule situation. There's mm -hmm. one rule that I've been advocating for decades, and I'm not the only one a lot of people have, but having played so much beach volleyball, Anybody who's familiar with that game knows that you cannot contact the ball with a one hand open hand contact. You don't get to open hand tip. You don't get to open hand set. And so that's the one I advocate even more strongly for because we're always um, uh, looking for ways to help the defense out and hinder the, the offense a little bit. And so if you took away the open hand set to save the close pass in indoor volleyball and if you took away the open hand tip and slam dunk and all the other things that you see <laughs> used so effectively indoors especially at higher levels the defense would be able to um, uh, the offense would lose a little bit of an advantage and I, I believe that we would see um, more of the kinds of plays that get people the most excited uh, rallies that extend beyond just serve pass set kill 
Mm -hmm. Uh, or sometimes just serve in the net and serve out when when we have overly aggressive serving, especially at the international men's level where they know that unless they serve a rocket that goes in the court, they don't have much chance of slowing the offense down. Hmm. So uh, I remember that one while you were asking your question. So <laughs> I, I played volleyball for many, many years. Um, started when I was six years old and played until I was about 46. So I had a playing career, about four decades. <laughs> Very rarely during that experience did I ever envision going on from uh, playing to coaching. Um, I was not at all convinced that I had the uh, patience for it and I was just so um, permeated and entrenched in thinking about how to play the best and how to be a part of the best team, both indoors and on the beach, that I just didn't give coaching much thought. Mm -hmm. But near the end of that career, uh, one of our boys was, um, our, our boys didn't grow up playing volleyball, but as they got into close to high school and into high school, they decided we would like to give this sport a try. We, uh, my wife and I were very um, soft on that, didn't want to push them into any given sport. So they played a little soccer, a little basketball, a little, little baseball and some other things and uh, finally gave volleyball a try. And so when the older one was nine in ninth grade, uh, he decided to go out for his small, uh, went to, attended a small school here in South Orange County in California. And um, he and his team uh, gave it a great effort, but they had a really rough season. And they lost every match that year. I think they lost 31 matches. But not only did they lose every match, they lost every game, or if you want to call it a set, every set of every match. So they went zero and 93. And my wife and I were just like, oh man, we would like to just see them go one and 92 instead <laughs> of zero and 93, just to have some small, small, tiny success. And, uh, but the season didn't work out that way. And so at one point near the end of it, my wife said, they could really use your help. I think you should think about doing some coaching. <laughs> and she said, I think you're right. Not for me, but I just want to see them get to 25 before the other team once in a whole season of three or four months. So I asked the school. They were kind enough to let me get involved, put a lot of hard work in and came out to play in the first match of that new season, a team that had beaten our team like a drum. <laughs> and we won that, that first game, 25-19, and the guys went, they, they went so crazy. It looked like they had just won the Olympics. It was just <laughs> awesome. It was incredible, and it felt so good to them because they had not won a single set, a single game to 25 in about two years, close to two years. Uh, so then we had to kind of calm down like, hey, you know, if we could do one of those, maybe we could do two. Maybe we could even do three and win a match. And they did calm down and they did go on to win the match. And so over the next four years, they got better and better. And that really infected me with the coaching bug to see them go from absolute rock bottom they did most of the work, all the work. I just uh, helped along the way and tried to um, facilitate more learning, mm -hmm. uh, make more efficient practices uh, and training plans so that we could get the most uh, or more out of every minute that we invested in our time together. Uh, but I did go in also making an assumption that turned out to be wrong. And my mm -hmm. assumption was, well, you know, I've played volleyball for 40 years. I've played high-level volleyball probably for 20 years. No, wait, I take that back. 30 years from 15 to 46. So I'm thinking I will probably be fairly immune to <laughs> the challenges that you face as a coach of younger athletes in high school, grade school, club, and that is the overzealous parent. I was unfortunately, or I guess I, I got a very quick lesson that I was not immune to that at all. 
and I'm of course a parent myself, so I understand the motivation. I totally it it always it almost always comes from a place of good intention. Parents want the best for their kids. They just don't often necessarily understand what's best. Here would be a misguided, I think, um, hunger to want what's best for your kid. If you want to protect your daughter or son's feelings when they lose and decide, okay, their feelings get hurt when they lose a game, so we're going to change it and not keep score, and we will protect them um, that is a well-intended, in my opinion, mistake. Because we don't go through life without losing. We lose all the time. We apply to a college and we don't get in. We um, were with a company and we bid against other companies for the right to provide services. We'll lose some of those. We have to acclimate ourselves. We have to learn how to fall down and pick ourselves back up. And well-intended things like, well, let's protect the feelings of our young people and uh, never keep score at any age, um, I think is a mistake. We, have, we need to keep score. We need to have a team come out on top. We need to have a team come out uh, behind. And we will learn from that and we'll get better from that. I'm not saying that we should keep score on every game of every age, especially very young ages, but um, the well-intended thing to, let's say, get rid of scores for 11 and 12 year olds in hockey or soccer, I don't think is serving our kids well, but it mm -hmm. comes from a great place. So I learned very quickly on, I was not immune from that. And that was ultimately good for me. And one of the lessons in teaching me to make as few assumptions as possible. Coach Brennan, go ahead. Uh, well, Coach, Coach um, I uh, started out coaching the same reason my kid, so it's really interesting to see a perspective. Um, I no longer coach her. There was a point where I couldn't teach her anymore, and I'm just curious um, what you would say for coaching your own kid and advice you would give to coaches out there that are coaching their own kids and is there a point where you shouldn't? Really good question. Bef you know, when my wife uh, said, boy, they could really use your help. Uh, and I thought I would love to help them taste a tiny bit of success. Uh, I left out a step, a really important step in that, and, uh, and you bring it up, so I appreciate the question very much. And that is, we needed to, I needed uh, especially to consult with our sons, because I was um, interested in coaching a team that they would both be a part of the next year. And uh, we essentially laid out the ground rules, you know, during practice, you are not my son, I'm not your dad, you're not gonna call me dad, um, and I'm probably going to have to be harder on you mm -hmm. than I am going to need to be on other people, more demanding, um, uh, holding you to a stricter standard, and that's gonna ultimately be to your benefit because if I don't do that, people are going to think you're only playing because you're related to the coach. Mm -hmm. And we have to do whatever we can to um, help the team understand if you are playing and there are no guarantees that you'll be playing, you're going to have to earn that. But if you are playing, it's because you earned it and not because you were given it. That's really unfair to them uh, if we don't do things that allow their teammates to understand that they earned it. And so we have to set up guidelines where it's going to be a little uncomfortable because I'm going to have to uh, hold them to a higher standard. And so when we laid all that out and then I, I said, it's your call. Um, would you, under those conditions, would you like me to coach? I'm interested in it, but I will not take offense to it. I won't be insulted. If you don't want me to coach, I'm completely okay with that. And I would understand it because you would want it to be your own thing. But ultimately they said, no, we both want you to coach. We understand <laughs> what we're getting ourselves into. 
And, uh, and so they were an integral part of that discussion. We had to have that before uh, I even approached the school. So I'm going to turn it over to me. Thank you for answering that question. Good question. Uh, Coach Cry, uh, you've been referenced as uh, the Wayne Gretzky of volleyball, just using a hockey reference here uh, for us Canadians. Um, but uh, uh, Jamie Nielsen uh, from London, Ontario, thanks for being such an inspiration and hero to me as I discovered the game in high school in the early 80s. Two questions. I think we're just going to hit the first one, Jamie. Um, how do you feel about the formality of the game, and do you see that changing in the future? Uh, example, as a coach, I, I hate how the game slows down with formal, uh, you know, uh, slow substitutions. I know it's quicker in the States um, uh, based on the tournaments that I've been to down there, but uh, even having to walk on the court from the box or can't even come on the floor after a timeout, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know we've kind of talked about rule changes, but is there anything uh, on the sport level itself that you would hope to see change in the future? <clears throat> Um, Jamie, thank you for the question. It's a good one, and it's my frustration, too. I think there is too much stilted protocol that slows the game down. I guess one way I've heard it, and I can't remember. I would love to credit this person. Mm, maybe it was Joe Trinzi. I can't remember who said it, but they, the question was asked, think around all of the... Um, popular sports the world over, like when people watch the World Championships of Hockey or the World Cup of Soccer, in what sport does everything grind to a halt uh, and, and on the whim of the scorekeeper or on the order of the scorekeeper? Apparently only in volleyball. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's absurd. Scorekeepers should not, uh, I understand they, they mean well, and um, they're trying to do their job, but we have to structure it in a way where they can do their job without um, um, grinding, putting the brakes on an on a, a exciting match. And all of a sudden it takes 40 seconds to do two really simple substitutions. That's frustrating to us on the international level, mm -hmm. uh, or even just one substitution, just one player coming in. And all, so often you see the second referee say, no, 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 wait, wait, come back and stand where you were waiting to enter and leave because something didn't go right at the scorer's table. That doesn't happen in basketball. They just run on and the scorekeeper follows it. And the same should be for volleyball. So I share your frustration. Uh, we have to figure out better ways to allow the scorekeeper to do the job. And maybe it's to check in ahead of time and to just tell the scorekeeper, I'm going in for so-and-so, and and, uh, and so they can have some, just like a basketball player would, who kneels at the scorer's table and is waiting to enter the game until a stoppage in play. Mm -hmm. uh, the referee doesn't then stop the game, and everybody's watching while these players, they just run on and run off. We've got to figure out ways to facilitate that and make the scorekeeper's job easier. I, uh, there are still parts of protocol that I like, um, you know, when two countries are competing internationally, I think it's great for everyone to stand at attention for the flags and the anthems of both those countries, whichever of those, uh, whichever of those 206 countries that happens to be, there are certain parts of protocol that are nice, but there are others, especially once the game has begun, We've got to keep things moving. Mm -hmm. People didn't pay good money to go watch uh, scorekeepers execute substitutions. <laughs> they came to watch great ball. Mm -hmm. And it's not the scorekeeper's fault. It, I would like to say that. It, it, we have to change the structure to allow them to do their job more quickly and efficiently so that these sto stoppages don't so that they're not forced to create these stoppages. Sure, and I, I know that at the at the convention in Pittsburgh, there was a forum regarding on speeding up the game, but also slowing down the game. So, you know, um, 
watching the the finals in Pittsburgh there you know it went three straight sets and we we're in and out of the the arena within I know an hour and a half you know and I how do we slow the game down so it gets more entertainment value for commercials maybe and stuff like that like in between sets is there a longer break and then the sets go as you know however they however they pan out but I I know there's a fine line between speeding the actual the game up but also slowing it down f so that there's more opportunity for fans and entertainment value any thoughts on that that's a another very good question i think when you at let's say to the national championship game you're hoping for the two best teams in the land and you're hoping that they are well matched but sometimes it won't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one team will just be so much better than the other team on a given night. There's only so much we can do to slow things down. Um, some of the things that have been talked about, which could slow it down somewhat, are to not play three out of five, but to play four out of seven mm -hmm. or five out of nine. Shorter games or mm -hmm. sets. That would be a way to do it. I think it'd be fairly disruptive to do that, but it's certainly table tennis has gone that route. They used to play two out of three. Now they play, uh, I, th ooh, I think it's four out of seven or five. Shoot, I should know the answer to that. It's either four out of seven or five out of nine. Very short games. I think they only played at 10 or 11 points instead mm -hmm. of to 21 points like they used to. So that's a way that they approached it to accomplish the same thing, especially when you have some great dominant player they want the thing to last a little bit longer um but that's that uh that's an ever uh a slow brewing uh, i wouldn't call it a controversy but it's something that people are always giving thought to because they would like to see volleyball on television more mm -hmm. and so they're looking like, how do we make the match last at least a certain length of time, minimum, but also not go over a maximum length of time? Like, a two, two hours is a pretty good uh, time, and TV would love it if they could be guaranteed of volleyball lasting between an hour and 45 minutes and an hour and 56 minutes. But, mm -hmm. again... Life is more complicated than that. We don't always get what we wish for, and with especially with internationally with video replay and challenges. Now the game that we thought we uh, shrunk down to about two hours maximum with rally scoring and playing to 25 and then to 15 in the fifth set in the fifth game uh, has now ballooned right back up to two hours and 25 minutes, two hours and 30 plus with all the extra stoppages for challenges and things like that. So it's something that we'll always be wrestling with. And that's just, just a part of our sport. Fun to have debates and dialogues about as we look to try to expose it more consistently on television. Sure. Uh, question here from Jeff Anderson, uh, from Red Deer, Alberta. What percentage of practice time do you use individual or small group activities versus 6v6 to keep competition environment conditions the most game-like as possible? Good question, Jeff. Good question, Jeff, yeah. Um, we would like to spend at least half of our practice time whenever possible, if not more, doing things that are six on six volleyball because what do we do when we put a uniform on we do six on six volleyball we would like to have as little uh time in fact during that 50 percent plus of time how often would a coach initiate the activity as little as possible, preferably zero, because I've been doing this game, I've been involved in this game for uh, almost 55 years now, and I have yet to see a coach serve in a match when teams are competing <laughs> with uniforms on. I've yet to see a coach hit a, off a box in a match with uniforms on. And so we're trying to do everything we can to make it player-centered rather than coach-centered. 
Sometimes things might prevent us from that. What would be something that would prevent us from spending at least 50% of our time uh, competing in various types of six on six competition? One might be if we're short on middles. They're the ones who are doing the most jumping. And at the level we're at, as I mentioned before, players are playing virtually year round. We have to have a very high, uh, pay great attention and be very cognizant of the amount of work we're doing, they're doing and not to overdo it. We, we, we got to make sure that the mature athlete isn't over training and that we're putting them at a deficit that is going to catch up three weeks, three months or a year later when we are trying to prepare for the next competition or for the Olympic Games, things like that. So if we're short on middles, probably going to have to play less six on six. Maybe we'll have to play uh, a format that's five on five for part of it, where the middles are just off or are inactivated until the rally goes a little longer, something like that, because they are all uh, very often our limiting factor. The middles jump the most. So we stay most cognizant of the workload in terms of how much jumping they're doing. And if we hit a cap, either we have to deactivate them somehow or we have to shut things down. So we're pretty careful about that. But uh, when we have plenty of people and they're all healthy and capable of doing a good amount of work volume, then we'd like to have at least plenty, at least half of our uh, training, if not more, be of the six-on-six six variety. Awesome. Uh, question here from Chad Grimm. He's the head coach of uh, Thompson River University in British Columbia uh, women's team. Um, coach, what are your thoughts on VNL this year, and how do you think we should proceed with these global events, knowing all countries are in different places regarding the pandemic? Thanks, Chad. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Jeff, and a good, another good one. You guys are um, uh, hitting me with lots of good ones. <laughs> I think this one is, uh, I think the aspiration is that VNL, Volleyball Nations League, or Nations League, um, the aspiration is to play it as people envisioned it uh, and as we played it in 2018 and 2019. Go to a country, play a week. New country, new week. New, new uh, third week, new country. Fourth week, new country. Fifth week, new country. That's still the aspiration, but it's becoming clear that, well, first of all, right now, that's impossible. We couldn't play an event like that. Five countries, five, five weeks, five countries. Um, secondly, it's probably still going to be impossible in May, but we don't. N nobody really knows for sure in terms of how vaccinations are rolled out and things like that. So uh, I know that there's a lot of hard thinking going on right now um, as to okay, if we can't do that model, what model can we do? The other end of that spectrum, and the one that probably looks the most possible the most responsible is to just take all the teams uh, and put them in one place. That is 16 teams and they go to a bubble. We saw that with the WNBA and the NBA in the summertime. Mm -hmm. They went to one place and just basically formed a bubble. Um, no outsiders, no spectators and all of that. That's probably the easiest way to make the NL happen. So my guess, and I don't know for sure, and I'm not the person making, or I'm not a part of the decision-making process. Uh, I can give advice, but I don't. Uh, I don't make the decisions. Uh, and by me, by I, I mean we coaches. They, we are being asked for our feedback, not just me, but all the women's coaches, all the men's coaches will be. Uh, but probably the most doable is a single location bubble format where. All 16 teams are staying in the same hotel, probably each on a separate floor, each person in the delegation with her or his own room, and figuring out all the other aspects that go around with that. It's a very expensive format for mm -hmm. that particular single host to run. So 
certainly a financial challenge for that one host because uh, under normal VNL, everybody shares in the burden of hosting. This would not be a shared burden. Um, but of course, obviously, all of our teams are staying very optimistic and hopeful. We want to play VNL. Everybody wants some competition before the Olympics comes along some weeks later. And so it would be great to play competition after uh, playing zero competition in 2020. Great to have some actual competitive opportunities before the Olympics comes around. Uh, I'm just going to keep peppering you with questions if you're okay with that, Coach. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ryan Hofer, from uh, the head coach of the women's team at Trinity Western University. Um, what principles do you hold around player feedback during practice? How much, how much or little... Uh, Feedback do you give? Um, you know, that is yet another good question. I'm not sure. Um, there are clear answers. There's there's a, bitter, a bit of a uh, debate in terms of... Um, motor learning there there there's uh, a model i guess some people would call it a kind of an information processing model a prescriptive model that says that uh, i should tell people exactly how to do something uh, i should tell them if x then y it involves a lot of if then rules if the set is tight then this will happen. If the set is wide, then that will happen. Uh, and then there's uh, more of, I guess, what you'd call a CLA, like a con constraints-led approach, which is more of the thing of, let's put the constraints in, uh, and, and volleyball already has constraints. We could just play six-on-six -six volleyball, and there are already constraints. There is a net of a certain height. There are six players across the net. Three are in the front row, three are in the back row. There are sidelines and all the others, but we could add more constraints beyond that and then let the players explore, let them make mistakes. Let them almost, as I uh, heard Casey Kreider describe it, let, uh, let them start with a, um, a blank map and get over here and find that that didn't work. So mark that, um, area of the map off and say, well, that solution didn't work. And then I'll try this and I'll try this and I'll try this. Uh, those are maybe two different schools. I think I like a, a blend of that. Mm -hmm. we, we try to do a little more in the way of guided discovery and not just saying, this is the way it is. This is the best way to do it. These are the if then rules. Um, and, and then there are also things in terms of motor skill acquisition, um, some of the study says that learners do better when they have some control over their learning and control over the conditions. So that would make an argument for me to exam, uh, for example, to say, I'm going to be here. You're going to be doing this thing, maybe serve, receive or setting or attack. If we're working on the early part of practice where we're breaking the skills down into their parts before we get to six on six. And then I say, how much feedback do you want? And the play, and I hand some control to the learner that way. And the, or I'll just say, let me know when you want some feedback, but then I give a player some space to explore and to discover because Generally, when people are not just getting handed information and handed rules, they tend to, intuition would tell us that they tend to learn a little more deeply, mm. uh, learn a little more deeply from trying and failing, trying this solution and having it not work and try that one before they get to some better answers. So I think in, in our gym, we tend to try to uh, mix a little of all of that and most importantly, try to find out what works for each learner and because some people will not resonate to some people will be really uncomfortable if we say uh, it's up to you tell me how much 
how, how frequently you would like me to give you feedback. Uh, some people uh, will be so uncomfortable, they'll just say, I don't want to make that decision. I need you to make that decision. And so then we'll adapt accordingly. Great answer. Um, and I know Volleyball Canada is, 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 with all their education platforms and stuff like that, they're going down that road of more let the athlete find find the answer rather than just tell them the answer. So, uh, uh, but I like the, the, the idea of the blend of both, right? So. Yeah, and also that middle ground of guided discovery, like asking questions <laughs> where, um, because I, I ultimately I don't think as much as the blank map analogy is a nice one and I resonate to it, but ultimately once players have played the game for a little while, hopefully they've watched volleyball at a high level. So, for example, uh, kids growing up and watching Wayne Gretzky play hockey, they already knew most of the map was marked off because Wayne was so amazing, they would see what he was doing and know, okay, I probably want to do more of those things and less of complete, uh, of starting from a blank map and a blank slate and thinking everything's possible when I would probably be well served to just follow the example of Wayne Gretzky or LeBron James mm -hmm. or whoever it is in, in any given sport. So, um, uh, so asking questions, uh, when the set goes wide, what do you think is going to happen here? Or the set just did go wide, what happened and why? Uh, so that's, uh, that's a, I think um, a way to guide people to the answer a little faster than giving them no feedback and complete freedom to make every mistake and fill the map in. I think that's going to take a little too long to get to where we need to, to be. Uh, and like I said, as players play longer, they've already marked off most of that map. Once they've gotten to be an international player or a post-college player, most of that map is already marked off, and so we're and, and the improvements are harder to come by because they've been doing it so long, and, and so they're much more incremental, and uh, so the work is in some ways harder to, to make improvements. So I, I kind of like the uh, or not kind of I, I like the compromise of a more of a guided discovery approach. Fair. Uh, I just want to thank all the coaches for all the questions. Uh, uh, Coach Cry, we got a lot of great questions here, so I'm just going to just great. keep pounding through them, and uh, I appreciate your time. So this, uh, this, this question comes from Rhonda. She's the head coach of the Old College uh, women's team in Alberta. How do you navigate having difficult conversations about role changes within your team? For example, when one of your former bench athletes earns a starting position and replaces a current starting athlete, or when an athlete no longer has a position in your program? Great question, Rhonda. Um, well, the second one, good question, Rhonda. The second one is uh, more difficult than the first one. Uh, meaning if somebody has no longer has a role in the program um, that would be, I guess, a, uh, a, a, a cut situation or uh, somebody is just so many people have arrived in the program who are now playing at a higher level um, that there's less room or no room for that player. Ultimately, um, uh, while it's difficult to change the perception it's important and I've certainly not always been perfect at this nor will I ever will be we coaches are fallible just like any other human being but uh, more role clarity is better than less and so if somebody I guess in some ways uh, if somebody were playing regularly and then they're going to be playing less. They'll view that, I would imagine she would view that first and foremost as a demotion, as the team and the coaching staff don't value her skills as much as they used to or what she brings to the team, don't value her as much as a person. I'm not saying that any of that is true, but that's how somebody's gonna perceive it. So it's really important for 
us to do whatever we can to help that person understand that we still value her or him just as much as we did before as a human being and that we value her greatly as a player still but for the good of the team we believe that the team will be performing better with her uh, in a role that now has her on the bench so then we need to challenge her or him and say okay uh, I know you don't like that information uh, it's absolutely not easy for you to hear but um, in the so there are two big things in the meantime number one um, we need to help you fill this new role and just are you capable of it because we think you are uh, are you capable of crushing this role as a as a bench player if so here's what we're going to need from you we're going to need you to be supporting the team as a bench player we're going to need you to be um, watching others in your position and supporting them nobody feels good who's on the court who um, it's not a good situation if somebody's on the court and that person perceives that somebody who is off the court is rooting for the person who's on the court to fail mm. or who doesn't care about that person succeeding or not succeeding. We need to be in a much better position where even as hungry as I am to be on the court, the people who are on the court in my position need to know that I'm rooting them on mm. to great success no matter how badly I want to be on there. And so I need to be helping them be their best. But in the process of being involved and watching really closely, helping them, maybe being another pair of eyes, that also prepares me when my opportunity to compete comes up, when my number is called. And when my opportunity comes up, I want to be most prepared to show the team and the coaches when I go back in that um, that I can help the team and that's an opportunity to try and uh, change people's minds so uh, we want to help facilitate that and then I guess the other part of it is here are the standards and here are some of the things that led to our decision in the first place uh, of you moving from more of a consistent player to a bench player and here are the, you know, maybe it's a thing of, well, where, where do you think your opportunities are to bring your game up to a point where you've got a good shot to earn that uh, consistent um, set of opportunities back? And she or he, the player, might have an answer. You'll have an answer. And then you guys can figure out a, uh, a plan, a, a set of actions to try to help um, help shore up those areas that uh, are holding that player back and, and that led to the decision to play her or him less. So um, certainly clarity and open, if difficult, uh, conversations and decisions are, are very helpful. Coach Brennan, go ahead. That's a very good answer. Everyone has a role on the team and has responsibilities, and those roles can change, as you said, so it's a very great answer. Um, so team dynamic would change, obviously, with roles and, and things like that, and team culture. Um, how important is team culture or team dynamic and that team getting along and in success um, of a team versus a team that may not have that, with the changes of the role? Um. I think it's really important. Uh, all of us have been a part of different kinds of teams. If you had to have them uh, fall into three categories, one of them might be a team that on paper looks really good. The parts look really good, but that team ends up being less than the sum of its parts. Um, and underperforms for a variety of reasons, but many of which turn out to be 
interrelationship-based or trust-based, uh, culture-based. And those are usually the seasons that are the least fun. And everybody's been a part of teams like that. Then there are the teams that add up to about the sum of their parts. And that's a better situation. But the teams that, and, and everybody can look back on playing careers and think, wow, the, the my favorite season was the season when um, we added up to way more than the sum of our parts. And we brought out the best in each other. It didn't mean we always liked each other or loved each other every moment, just like families um, don't always uh, feel great um, positive passion for each other. We're going to have disagreements, but ultimately we figured out ways, uh, even though we're human beings and can't always feel perfectly positive about every human being around us, we figured out ways to get the best out of each other. And you can see those kinds of teams across the net. They're scrappy. They never give up. They never look like they're losing. Even when they are losing, they don't have body language that says they're deflated and they're already defeated before the last whistle has blown. They look like they're having fun. They're cheering each other on. They're celebrating each other. They're probably celebrating the successes of their teammates more than the, sec the successes that they themselves have. And those are just more fun situations to be in. Everybody understands and, and has had things like that and knows the great joy uh, that a season like that holds. So I think that's what most teams aspire to, is to be that third kind of team, the kind of team that adds up to more than the sum of its parts. That's a very good answer. And is, we've all had those experiences where if we've been a part of, as a player or even as a coach where, even in my career where they get along or they don't get along. And the more enjoyable ones are when you, like you say, when you go past your expectations of that team and, and have fun because they all enjoy being around each other and support each other. Yep. And everybody has a clear role or whatever the role is. If it's, even if it changes, they embrace it. They get through their disappointment and then embrace that role for the good of the team. Uh, going back to the prior answer, I also don't want to discount. I, I don't think we're living in utopia. Uh, I don't think, I think it's okay um, for us, for players to have uh, some individual desires. I think we're asking for perfection if we're asking for players to have zero care for anything uh, any opportunities that happen for them personally and 100% care for uh, the team. And so it's just human nature that we want to get better. We want to have an impact on how the team does. And so I'm not going to discount that. I don't want the player to focus 100% only on herself or himself, but to have some individual motivations some individual goals within the team sport is just, that is human nature. And so we're better off, rather than denying that or trying to smother it, we're, we're better off trying to say, yep, that is a part of a team sport. Is there, is going, there are individuals who play it who have individual aspirations. Let's try to harness some of that, even though we try to guide it all into the team concept. Awesome. I will turn it over to Dave. There's lots of questions. Yeah, if you're okay, we get 20 more minutes. If that if that's all right with you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this question is from Ron Thompson. He's a he's, he's a legend coach in in Alberta, Canada. So uh, uh, he says, um, Coach Cry, you are a legend. You are legendary in your ability to read and react in playing the game. How do you transfer this to your players as a coach? Can you talk about your philosophy and methods of teaching players to play defense like yourself? Really good co uh, question, Coach. Um, you know, there's still a lot to be learned. Um, that part of volleyball is... Uh, I guess you, one term to use for it is perceptual expertise, the ability to recognize what's happening on the other side of the net, to see certain patterns, 
and to understand what those patterns likely mean and then make uh, both to do it quickly and to do it accurately and then to help have that lead to good decisions that help your team. Um, there's still a lot to be studied on that and it follows very much along the same continuum on one end of, or on the same spectrum. On one end, you have this very prescriptive thing of um, I'm going to tell you uh, exactly what to look for and I'm going to tell you that X means Y and Z means G and W means T and I give you these if-then rules. And then on the far other end of that spectrum, again, is uh, to give no guidance and to just let, if anything, to, there have been some studies where they've experimented with, for example, um, uh, might have been uh, play, uh, tennis players. And so they gave them a fake, um, it was like to occupy their mind and let their less conscious mind explore and learn. And so the, the instruction was, tell me how fast the serve was, that each time a serve comes at you, you're going to tell me what speed you think it was. When in reality, that wasn't what the people who ran the study or the coaches were hoping for. They're not caring if a player can tell me how many miles per hour the serve was. They were occupying the conscious mind so that the less conscious mind could then, uh, just by trying to pay more attention to something that didn't mean so much, they're paying attention to the whole movement, which might then help them hone in on clues that the server is giving me. Like if in tennis, if the, the toss is more out to my right, just like in volleyball, the ball is out here, it probably means that the serve is going to come back more to my left for me, for the defender, reverse all of that. But, um, but to occupy the, so that would be the other end of the spectrum is to give no instructions and in fact, distract the conscious mind a little and let the less or subconscious mind work through some of the nuances of that pattern that's developing. I tend to try to work somewhere in the middle with that guided discovery approach. But I don't know that people have uh, at all the clear answers as to the best way to teach perceptual expertise. So um, uh, in terms of decades of studies and decades of clear and consistent results that tells us the route there. So, but in general, I try to um, combine and, and find myself in the middle more with that dis guided discovery approach. And it might be, um, you know, the information rich zone is, in a hitter is somewhere in this area from my belly button to up here. So what do you see when you look in that area? Or what did you see on video when you looked at that hitter? Or what did you see in, um, in that last hitting attempt from the hitter. Uh, even with that, I have to concede that um, I don't know that that's the best approach because ultimately the things we see, we don't necessarily uh, have to, maybe we can't, maybe it's not even possible to describe in words. Wayne Gretzky probably certainly didn't need to describe in words what he was seeing. It was pictures. And so when we use words to try to get that out of our athletes, we're going down a slightly different route when the, the, the thing we're perceiving is a picture. It's not a group of words. Um, I remember reading a great article about reading ability, and it specifically talked about Wayne Gretzky, who I'm a huge fan of as the as the incredibly great hockey player that he was. But the quote from an opposing goaltender was, 
because Gret, you know, the question was, what are you thinking when Gretzky is leading a fast break, coming at your goal, and the goaltender said, "Oh my God, what does he see that I cannot see?" Uh, because he knew there were things that Wayne Gretzky was seeing that he couldn't see, and it was going to put Wayne at a big advantage. And so again. Those are pictures, and we don't do this volleyball thing talking it through. That slows us down. If I'm playing defense and I'm saying, "Look at the hitter, look at the shoulder," the whole thing was done by the time I even get those words out. So we have to work more, uh, more in pictures and less in words. And so I don't know if we have any great answers there, but I'm trying a number of approaches in terms of. Uh, at least guiding people's eyes to the right spot and seeing if they can start making some better decisions. Great answer, uh, Coach Cry. Um, Doug Reimer, uh, a mentor of mine, um, he's the UBC women's head coach. Um, has a has a great question here. He's, he go over the past decade. Have you noticed an increase in injuries among high school age players? Is it increased? Uh, is it increased due to sports or position special, special, specialization, uh, too much volume, or not enough balance on court and proper uh, preventative measures? Any advice for coaches on how to address? Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Coach Doug. Um, I don't know if I've seen, I mean, anecdotally, it seems to be the case that injuries in youth sports, not just volleyball, but in youth sports, are on the rise. Um, common sense, the common sense in me says, yep, yeah, that, that can make sense. So I'm not going to rule it out, even though I think we need a lot more um, information beyond anecdotes, even though, of course, statistics is really just an accumulation of anecdotes. But I think it would be, we'd be well served and maybe the information is out there and I just haven't looked for it hard enough or, or found it. But um, common sense tells me injuries are on the rise and uh, common sense to me would say a couple of things. Number one, there is, especially in the United States, there's an ever-growing tendency to specialize in one sport at earlier and earlier ages. I am not a fan of that trend. I much prefer to see people at least until 13, 14 years old exploring a variety of sports. Uh, I think it's just better for them to, to do that for a variety of de developmental ways. First of all, it's good for them to know which one they like the most. And what a great way to learn which you like the most is to learn which you like less, like to try some out and find out that you don't resonate to that as much. But um, also each different sport has its own surfaces and different movements. And so by playing a variety of sports, um, people get used to different movement patterns and they're not doing the same ones over and over for 12 months a year. And so I, I think uh, that could be part of the explanation is this tendency to specialize by the time somebody might be, let's say, nine years old and just play that one sport full time uh, 20 or, uh, you know, 24 uh, seven, 12 months a year. Um, Another part of it, specifically in volleyball, oh, actually, before I go on to that, I would say, for example, uh, I grew up playing um, a good amount of, a, a ton of soccer. I also tried some swimming, some tennis, uh, a little, uh, uh, some little league baseball, uh, just goofed around in basketball and did some other things. So I tried a variety of sports and I think it was greatly to my benefit uh, one of the ways is, for example, in soccer, um, I, if I have the ball and I'm looking to make my teammate better, or another way to say it is, how do I make my teammate's job easier? 
the way to do that is very often not to put the ball right to my teammate. If I see my teammate has a defender, um, you know, Coach David, if, if I'm looking at you on the screen and I see there's a defender over your left shoulder, then what I do to make your job easier is pass you in space to your right to get you away from that defender. And now I just made your job a little easier. So this idea of I'm not giving you the ball right to you, I'm giving you the ball in a place that actually makes your job easier and makes you better mm -hmm. is a really important concept in soccer, and it very much applies to volleyball. When the serve is coming over the net, it's not so often that the setter is already waiting there. The setter, she or he, is probably on their way to getting to the spot that they want to wait to. But even if they are waiting there, I actually make that setter better, not by putting it right on the setter's head, but by moving the setter forward a little and getting, it, uh, getting that setter more into the center of the court, maybe away from wing blockers. And so... Um, and the setter is giving a ball to hitters who are moving also. No setter gives a ball to a hitter who's standing right where they're going to hit. They give a ball ahead. They lead the setter. So soccer was a great teacher of, okay, where do I put the ball to make his or her job easier? I tried to apply that a lot in volleyball. And so I was rarely ever trying to give it to somebody. I was trying to put it in the um, in the most ideal spot possible to optimize the next person's job, to make the person's job easier so that that person can make all the hitters' job easier. Uh, so that's a huge side benefit to playing or, you know, in basketball, we often pass, we have to lead and, and allow a player to run to meet the ball as they're breaking toward the basket. We don't throw it right to them. In football, in American football, same thing. So there are great lessons to be learned from other sports that I think we miss if we're only playing one sport. And then the other thing, back to injuries, especially in our country, is that so many, uh, first of all, there's so much competition and juniors and uh, kids in high school and in club are playing so much that there's a lot of wear and tear on their bodies and so much of that competition happens in convention centers. So you have a <laughs> cement or a concrete floor, you've got a millimeter or two of some kind of felt underneath it and then you put a plastic sport court surface on top of that. I can't think that um, you know sport court is doing its best, but when you're working in the temporary conditions of a convention center that's just not as good for a developing player's body as being on a hardwood floor with some give and spring to it. So those would be the two big things to me, even though I don't have all the answers and I never will in this or anything else, but uh, the, the big ones would be uh, increasing and earlier specialization and the kind of venues that people are playing more and more in. Now, uh, kind of a, a side question to that, what are your thoughts on the evolution of the volleyball itself? So for example, here in Canada, someone might play with uh, a Bodden ball in, in high school, they might play with a Mikasa ball in club, and then they're gonna play with a Molten ball in college or university. Um, what are your thoughts on and they're all different styles. They float differently. They spin differently. What are, what are your thoughts on the ball itself? Um, I'm agnostic, I think, for the most part. Um, I don't think we can mandate that only one ball be used, especially in leagues and locations where they're of more limited resources. I completely understand that they have to be able to get a kind of a volleyball where they can afford to have enough volleyballs for their team to mm -hmm. train. And so if it means something that costs a lot less, I'm all for it so that that team can can train properly. You know, rather have 10 cheap volleyballs, um, not so cheap that somebody's forearms are getting injured, but just a less expensive model than one high quality volleyball for 12 people to share. 
Um, secondly, while agnostic on that, uh, the volleyball that tends to float the most and move and dance the most, especially when it has little or no spin, is the Mikasa. Mm -hmm. That's the one we are trying to be masters of controlling at the international level. Uh, at tournaments like the Olympics, World Championships, World Cup, and annually in the Volleyball Nations League. So we spend the vast majority of our time working with that ball because that's the ball we're, again, using the principle of what's going to happen in a match. Well, that's going to happen in a match, so we need to work with that, uh, that tool or that object. Uh, so the selfish, a small selfish part of me would say I'd love to see more Mikasa use in college volleyball where, because really uh, our developmental league in the United States is college volleyball. The, uh, all of the top players, all of the players who come to our program spent their college years playing with college teams in various conferences. And so it comes as a surprise to them when they go for most of four years without touching that ball, especially to passers yeah. who are like, whoa, holy smokes, what just came at me? That ball just drifted six feet. So would I like them to have more experience by the time they come to our gym with that ball? Yes, I would, but I, I'm not going to try and be a dictator and mandate that. It's to our, a little to the detriment of that develop, uh, of the development of that player, but every every group makes to make uh, gets to make its own rules and we also have to consider especially after the last 9 months how hard people's budgets have been hit. So For sure. we're absolutely not going to mandate a certain kind of volleyball that might cost a little more when when that turns into an ever important expense when mm -hmm. times are really tough economically. For sure. All right, Coach Brennan, I'll let you uh, ask the last question. Go ahead. Sounds good. Um, recruitment for any coach is, is, is a stressful or just difficult process. Um, what characteristics or skills do you look for in, in recruiting an athlete? First of all, I would say that I am spoiled. Um, <laughs> we really don't have to do much recruiting for our program. Um, and again, we're fortunate. Uh, people who are some of the stronger American college players, all Americans, those are the people who tend to have the greatest aspirations to continue playing beyond college and then there are two opportunities to do that are to play professionally in various leagues around the country, uh, sorry, around the world. And I would also insert, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, but the United States has a new professional league that's going to be uh, starting I think some of our players are traveling there four weeks from yesterday. Uh, it's called Athletes Unlimited, and they had a really successful uh, inaugural softball season in August and September, and now they'll have the first ever Athletes Unlimited volleyball season mm -hmm. in Dallas coming up in February and March. So we're super excited about that. Always have aspirations of having a professional league in in uh, North America, in, especially in the United States, because there are so many players. So uh, really excited to have that league join the world of leagues that happen in countries like Turkey and Italy and Germany and Poland and Russia, and Brazil, Korea, J China, um, Japan, and others. Um, so there are a lot who aspire to play volleyball beyond college and one way is professionally and the other way is to try to play on the national team to see how good they can be and to see how they measure up against the other great teams in the world. So our program in many ways recruits itself and also selects out itself. If somebody doesn't aspire to the difficult challenge that comes with um, coming to spend some time in our gym, in our USA program, then I honor that. It's not for everybody because basically you're coming from being 
the badass on your team <laughs> to a gym that is just full of badasses. And so when it's full of them, there's there all, all of a sudden you're no longer or, or maybe it's, you know, the top graduate in your class. And then you go to a place like Harvard and everybody's a valedictorian. So all of a sudden it becomes uh, and and then they know how to play an instrument and speak three other languages. So. It gets really intimidating, so that's not easy, and it's not for everybody. But we love it when people aspire to measure themselves, to test themselves, to throw themselves into that difficult situation, that shock and the the jarring situation that is. I've been the best for a long time, and now I'm going to a place where I might be the worst. How will I? How will I handle that? Um, but that's how we start. We have to take those steps. So, um, uh, so from a recruitment standpoint, take what I say with a lot of <laughs> grains of salt because I'm not acclimated to doing a lot of that. But what I would say is, um, uh, I liked the way Chris. Peterson, who was a football coach at Boise State, and then he went to Washington. I think he's still there. But um, uh, Boise State is not the easiest place to recruit football players to. It's far easier to recruit them to Alabama or an SEC school, for those who know American football, or to a Big Ten school, uh, where it's just a lot higher visibility. And so they were not used to and didn't expect to recruit many, quote, blue chip players, top 10, top 50 players to, Fred, uh, to Boise State. What they did instead is they were very clear on their culture, on what kind of person they wanted for their program. Certainly somebody who is hungry to learn and get better because they figured we can teach the skills of football. We can't necessarily teach all of the attributes of the kinds of character that we want in our program, but he would call it OKG, our kind of guy. We're going to get, we're going to recruit people who are OKG for the Boise State program, who are a good fit to the culture of our team, and then we'll teach them what they don't know football-wise. And so we think of that a little with our program. Uh, OKG, our kind of gal, and we've got a lot of OKGs. We've got an amazing group of women who are a part of our program, and it's an honor and a privilege to work with them every day. And we've also got an amazing staff of women and men who are an honor and a privilege to work with. But I think uh, a good help, uh, maybe a, I don't know if it's a starting point, but it's certainly something to consider is for your program, what is OKG? And then, you know, lay out the things that are really important in your culture and uh, and try to identify the people who might be the best fit, the most OKG. And then I think you're you're going to make some, you know, more often good decisions than bad ones when it comes to bringing new people in. Of course, the challenge is teasing out some of those things. You know, maybe you want people who have uh, very high levels of grit. They're just, they're tenacious. If they get knocked down, they don't uh, get pinned down. They'll pick themselves back up. So you have to tease out some of those things, but it's important to be clear on what your culture, um, uh, what's important in your program and then to recruit for that, to recruit our kind of gal or our kind of guy. And, um, and and so I, I think that's a, a helpful compass, and it certainly was a huge help at uh, at Idaho State, or sorry, at Boise State, um, uh, for for Chris Peterson there. Uh, you know, they they were the ones with that distinctive blue artificial turf surface that they play American football on too. So that stood out. But more more importantly, what stood out was his idea of we're very clear on the kind of person we want to have in this program, and we're looking for OKG. Excellent. New terminology I wrote down. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's so important for all of us coaches out there um, that will be, once these 
restrictions are lifted, uh, recruiting and, and building our team. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here. I will turn it over to Dave, but I just have to say um, I really enjoyed this session and honored to be a part of it. Um, something in my coaching as a player and I will remember. So thank you for letting me be a part of this and joining us today. So I'll turn it over to Dave. Coach Cry, uh, you know, we're all, uh, I would say the vast majority of us are in lockdown. So just before before we shut this down, are there any good books that we should be looking at during this uh, time of lockdown? Um, I get asked that regularly, <laughs> and I, I will give you an answer, but I always hesitate because what happens is I learn to, I listen to podcasts, you probably do too. Like we're all hungry to get better. Yeah. And everybody has their recommendations, and then all of a sudden I have a list of 60 books I have to read, and it just <laughs> becomes overwhelming. Like, <laughs> ah, you know, I, I just I can't read that many books, and everybody said, you know, if, if I hear 50 people and they all give me their favorite book and they're all different, uh, there's no way to get so I always miss, I feel like I'm missing out on something or that I'm overloading myself. So I hesitantly give uh, this answer, <laughs> but um, shoot, I've got to pick one and there's three and I also don't want to give the answer of three because I'm making the problem even worse. Um, Was me in the middle too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think one of the more impactful books I've read in the last few years was, um, the book Peak, P-E-A-K by Anders Ericsson. He's one of the foremost, uh, experts on studying expertise and studying skill development. Many books have been written about him. Um, and so, for example, we've heard that phrase 10,000 hours of uh, people you know, reaching um, elite levels of performance. I, I think the 10,000 hours thing has been misquoted, mistranslated. There is no recipe for becoming Wayne Gretzky. It's a, a combination of a lot of ingredients. But anyway, Anders Ericsson has a lot of great information to share in the book Peak in terms of how to help people pursue mastery in whatever they're doing. The idea of deliberate practice, uh, or in our case, what he would probably call and term purposeful practice. There's a small, a subtle, but not insignificant distinction there. Um, but uh, lots of good information uh, in pursuing mastery. One of the ones that really resonated to me, uh, because we have so many coaches on here and we're all in this together in terms of trying to be better on the coaching front, is this idea of practicing and improving while doing our job. So he gives in the book Peak this hypothetical, but it happens all the time. Let's say we all work in a company uh, or we work in the department of a company and um, Coach Penny, let's say uh, you need to give us a presentation uh, you're going to take us through a PowerPoint. You're going to give us an update on the areas where you have responsibility within our team. So that's doing your job. But the way to make it more mindful and to help you actually make improvements is you could you could tell us, hey, I'm going to give you all um, this update. I'm going to take you through this presentation, but while I'm doing it, I have a focus to get better at something. And so for me, my focus is I want to tell 
some stories. People really resonate to stories. And so I'm going to be telling, I'm going to be weaving a couple of stories into this presentation. I'm interested in getting better. I want your feedback afterward. I want you to tell me one thing I did well and one thing I can do better. And now you've flipped that. And so now you are learning and practicing within the course of just doing your job. So that could be really powerful if you make it more mindful and seek out feedback. Mm -hmm. So how would I um, bring that to what we do? Well, I think one of the downsides of all the coaching um, education that's out there, maybe some of this could be called coaching education, but certainly when I, let's say there's a, a clinic um, in a city and I go there with 200 coaches and I sit in the bleachers and I hear from some great coaches and I'm writing things down and I'm taking notes. That's not the best way to learn. Um, it is a pale, uh, it's just, it's far better to learn the way I told you that Penny would try to learn, Coach Penny, and that is, I'm getting better at this aspect, or I want to present information in a better graphical manner. So watch that as I do this. So soliciting some feedback is really powerful, and you're not going to get that when you go to a coaching seminar or a clinic and sit in the stands. The most powerful learning is by doing. Mm -hmm. And so how can you do that? Well, if you coach in a club situation, you can get together with some of your fellow coaches and say um, to one or several of them, will you come watch my practice? I'm going to coach my team, but I have a focus here. I'm going to tell more stories or I'm going to use more questions. Uh, I'm focusing on my guided discovery or I'm doing this. Like I, I have a specific aspect, the best learning happens when we're doing it in our environment, where we do our work, where we do our teaching. And we don't get that very much as coaches. So it would be really powerful for each of you to have some colleagues whose opinion you trust, people who are um, going to give it to you straight, mm -hmm. but they also have great intentions for you. They're not going to shred you to pieces. They mean the best for you. And then hopefully they will ask you for feedback on something that they're going to work on. But if you can form these teams of coaches or find uh, Coach David, you mentioned uh, you got you took a que question from a, a mentor, you know, having him come into the gym and just watch you and you say, here's what I'm working on, coach. Mm -hmm. um, give me some feedback afterward. What did I do well? What did I do poorly? That also comes from another book, and I'm not going to tell you the name of it to make you feel bad for not reading it, but the you can guess the author and the book, but it is a surgeon, and after five years or so of doing surgery, he felt like he had hit a lull. He, he was stuck on a plateau. He wasn't getting any better. That happens a lot. It can happen to coaches. Mm -hmm. It can happen to teachers. It can happen to electricians. It can happen to surgeons. Mm -hmm. But he did something that most people don't think of. And he, he uh, reached out to a former medical school professor. And he said, will you come watch me do surgery? I feel like I'm stuck. Um, will you please give me some feedback? And so he did. That's an active step. He didn't go attend a seminar. He didn't go sit in the stands and listen to a great surgeon. He asked for feedback, asked for help while actually doing his job. Mm -hmm. And the way he told the story was great because every so often he'd look over his shoulder during the surgery and he saw his former professor madly writing down things in a notebook and he's thinking, holy crap, what am I doing wrong? Wait, I thought I was pretty good. Why is he writing all this stuff down? Like, he, so, he, so he had to get beyond the worry of, wait a minute, why is he writing down so much? Um, what's he going to tell me? 
But instead, like for example, one small thing he learned is when you do this part of the procedure, you hold your elbow higher. And you're, when you are working for three hours, why would you, you wouldn't want to increase the strain on your shoulder. You need a lot of fine motor control. And if you get your shoulder exhausted by the end of three hours, you're opening the door increases the chances even by a little bit that you might make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, whoa, yeah, I never thought he never would have noticed that mm -hmm. if he didn't have somebody else watching. So that goes back to a great concept I got from Peak and from other books, and that is try to be really active. Get somebody that you trust to come watch you. F figure out something to get better at. Uh, it's not just about sitting in the stands and listening to a great coach. It's about doing it one coach at a time. Uh, maybe get a cadre of coaches, people who can be um, feedback partners, um, player coaches, if you will, to help you get a little better within you actually doing your job. I think there's huge power in that. And um, uh, it's, it's a very proactive step that people can take. That's, that's awesome, Coach Karai. I really... Uh appreciate your time and your insight on and your knowledge of the game you know this has been an absolutely uh, amazing session i can talk to you for probably seven or eight more hours easily um but anyways i just want to thank you for your time from from all the coaches here in canada um you know we we cheer on uh our neighbors uh to the south and uh team usa and, and all the women on it and uh, look forward to hopefully, you know, again, the, the Olympics in the summer and, and, and all that will bring. So uh, I just want to say thank you from all of us. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to visit with you both and with all the other coaches out there. Uh, again, I want to apologize for the delay at the start of this, but it's been just a privilege to visit with you. I wish you all great luck in doing the same thing that we all are doing and that is pursuing being better uh, pursuing mastery as coaches and um helping pursuing helping our team our teams pursue uh competitive team mastery so i wish you all great luck cheering you all on and thank you for all of your hard work Coaches don't get thanked enough for what they do by the people that they serve. And so thank you for your dedication and your sacrifice and all the, all the uh, countless hours you put into it and wishing you all the best of success in this year and in the years to come. Sounds good. Stay safe, Coach Karai, and we'll chat soon. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.